Great, press record. Okay, let's get started. Um, hopefully that won't text my computer too much. Um, so this is the note well. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, you should be. These are the terms and conditions under which you participate in the ITF uh, regarding things like intellectual property, harassment, conduct, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, we do take it seriously. If you have any issues, uh, please contact Tommy and I, your chairs, uh, or any questions. Uh, and and the, we can't resolve it for you. We can point you to the right person for that, whether it's the Amsbuds team or uh, the area director or whoever else. Uh, so let's look at the agenda, which means I have to press buttons. There. Can folks see the agenda, albeit in markdown form? Oh, it's very agenda like. Okay, I have to probably have to unshare the web browser, maybe. There we go. Um, so today we're going to talk just about the active extension drafts. Uh, so start with prioritization, then signatures, then digest, then the cookie bis, uh, then H2 bis, and then finally BCP56 bis. <clears throat> Does anybody have any bashing for the agenda? I actually have might add one 30 second item, which is a quick update on cache status and proxy status, if that's okay. That's um, okay with me. Okay. We have time. All right. Thank you. Um, and we need folks before I forget to fill out the blue sheets, uh, which is also linked here. If you could just go to that page, which does have the correct date in it, and now I'm wondering why I didn't update that one as well. Um, you can add your name and your affiliation, so we have a record of, who, of who's attended. Uh, we'll also take a snapshot of the, the Zoom list, but uh, it would be really helpful if you could put your name in there as well. Um, okay, well, I think we can go ahead and, and, and move along then. Yeah, just First a, maybe a quick note before we jump into that. Um, sure. Saw that we now have official RFCs for both uh, structured headers and client hits. So I think yes. we worked on those. and. Glad to get those finally stamped up. Yes, it took a little while. Okay, uh, so first up, Lucas, uh, you want to take it away with prioritization? I would love to. Can you hear me okay? Yep. You don't have slides, correct? Uh, not for this one. It's a tale of two spec presentations for me today. Um, so on the priorities draft, uh, we are at zero open issues. Uh, Kazuo and I put a draft 03 out. Uh, early January um, and sent an email to the group to advertise that, uh, closing out those issues. And so we haven't really heard anything back from that. So I think we're in a good place. Um, I haven't heard much from people who have actually like tried priorities out and, and give any feedback, but given how we simplified the scheme and that we've addressed the kind of the tension with the signaling, I, I think we're in a good place. Um, you know, speaking personally, uh, for HTTP3, we have the ability to prioritize according to that scheme, but uh, we're not yet in a place where that's rolled out for any logical experimentation. I'm aware of Chrome, say, sending that frame. Um, but yeah, I I think we welcome input as long as it's not on any anything that we've already covered and closed out. There was quite a lot of discussion around the summer autumn time trying to get through some of the, maybe the philosophical side of the prioritization and um, we've tried our best to reflect that discussion into considerations for implementers without getting bogged down with giving specific advice to you know this is how you should do it where we know that probably won't work for the certain kinds of implementations who might want to consider this scheme so yeah i, I don't really have anything more to say on it So what would you suggest the path forward be? Uh, do you think we're ready for working group last call? Do we want to let implementers play with it a bit more? Where do you see this going? I I, I don't know. I think I, I'd like to say, let's go for a last call and then and then see if anything comes back during that process, if we get some more review. Um, and then, yeah, let's see how it goes. But I'll, I'll take the chair steer here because like that we we had 
priorities go wrong before and i don't want to rush something into the into the rfc process that we might find isn't okay my my hope and my belief is that won't be the case because it's simplified but um you know the some of this uh, backport into h2 might be a bit trickier but h3 is now you know almost close to done as well and we're going to see more stable mature rollouts of of quick and h3 so my my feeling is that maybe people might look towards more of the performance angle here and then realize that okay we we need to try this out now um, okay so i, um, I don't know if I'm... sure i i you know at one point in the past there was some some sense of urgency around getting this shipped i i don't think we're in that place right now though i think if we wanted to let this get some implementation experience we could let it sit for a while correct i think I think it would work for me. Um, I, I haven't seen anyone saying, like, in the last year that we, we really have to get this done. Okay. Yeah. Seeing implementation results would be very helpful. Um, it does look like we have Alan in the queue. So if he wants to speak up. Yeah, I was just, I guess I was wondering <clears throat> what, has there been much interop on it at all or? I mean, I know we have an implementation and we are starting to do some experiments with it, but uh, that's within our own apps and, and servers. But I'm just curious. So you said we haven't heard much of implementers, but could you give a little more color? Yeah, I, I mean, the, my my experience is effectively channeled through the, uh, you know, the quick interop work that we do. So looking at some of the multiplexing angles of stuff, um, maybe doing hackathons, it's not, you know, a, a conclusive demonstration. I think a part of the the difficulty there is even like the the interrupt test for H three compared to the quick transport layer are uh, uh, slim, um, I would say. And so uh, trying to design tests for this is is tricky. It's a quite you know subjective and, and manual process. Um, I'd, I'd happily work with anyone who's got some bright ideas. Are doing this or some effort like i think that's what i've been lacking at the moment is is any time to kind of really drive that and uh, encourage people to to try things out um, so if if people want to help and get involved then um please get in touch thanks looks like uh, ben is also in the queue hi my name is ben sabeki i work for google um I just wanted to give a quick heads up about the uh, implementation status in terms of H2 and H3, both uh, Google servers and uh, in terms of Chrome. Um, so as far as H3 goes, we never had any priority scheme implemented other than the priority update and it's implemented and it seems to be working. Uh, we haven't done a lot of investigations about you know, performance or what is actually happening, but you know, at least things don't crash and we don't error out, which is is great. Um, I don't have a lot of feedback in terms of implementation. It was relatively straightforward, uh, except for the part, of course, when you have to store priorities for streams that have not been created yet. But it's it's not. It's not, I didn't find it to be a big deal. Um, as far as H two goes, um, note that our current implementation with the H two dependency and weight. Um, scheme is that we effectively, at the beginning, um, you, you know, when we had speedy at the beginning, we had buckets, just like the priority update um, specification says. So it's it's nicely, we are going back to the original scheme in a way. Um, and when the HTTP2 dependencies and weights were um, wrote up, then what we did first was to encode the priority bucket number into the weight and then only consider the weight, which is not the weight was intended to do, of course. And then finally, we got around to doing a dependency-based approach, but our dependency was a chain. And we essentially had things you know, ordered by bucket. Um, and that is what is we are what we are doing right now in Chrome, uh, Google servers, right now are um, still considering the weight. So it's still not doing exactly what the H2 spec tells us to do. But this means that when we actually get around to implementing the HTTP 
and the, I'm sorry, the priority update, the new frame type, then from a functionality standpoint, it's not going to be a huge difference. So I do not expect a lot of difference in terms of performance. Um, and it's on my plate to implement it in Chrome um, and also in the server. Uh, but it's not it's not going to happen very very soon. So I'm not I'm not making a request to hold on with the last call until we have implementation um, experience. But it's it's coming. We we do certainly uh, intend to implement it. Cool. Thanks for that. Just just one clarification point. Um, last time I checked, it was in on older version of the priority update frame that you were using. I think maybe 01, um, and there was a breaking change in that frame format. So I just wondered if you're up to date with draft 03 or when? Yes, for HTTP 3, we are up to date with the new uh, frame type and format. Brilliant. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. And then I guess I would ask maybe both for Ben Snell, and since you talked about that implementation, implementation experience, even if it was only kind of within your own deployments, if at some point you do have some proof measurements or any measurements you can share or do that with the list that would, I think, help give us the confidence we need in this. Ours are a little bit early days, but I think we should have some data to share maybe by March ITF. Cool. Okay. Okay, if I have anything, I'll circle back, but we, we might not have the resources right now to do like an A-B experiment. Um, <clears throat> any other comments or input on the prioritization draft? Okay. So it, it sounds like we want this to gather a little more implementation feedback. Um, I guess Tommy and I will have a chat about the precise process we want to use for that, but uh, we would encourage folks to take another look at it and make sure that you have any questions or any issues, you raise those now. Um, and we might use a working group last call as a mechanism to make sure that that gets done. But we'll, we'll have a chat and then we'll talk to Lucas and Kazuo and, and figure out the path forward with this draft. So, thanks, Lucas. Okay, next up, signatures. I think this is Justin. Yep. So I should be on here. All right, uh, so yeah, I also don't have any slides. So uh, if you wanna pull up the draft, that'd uh, be fine. Um, and uh, not, a, not a whole lot of updates, although, wait, that was published today? That's news to me. This is just the latest version. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. I yeah. saw that line. I was just like, well, so, so to, to e explain why my surprise may have actually been warranted, um, it's been really difficult to get a hold of, uh, our lead editor, Annabelle, uh, over the last, uh, six months or so, I think just her day job has taken her, um in a direction where uh she hasn't been able to uh really dig into this particular piece of work i've also not been um really looking at it directly because i've been focused on uh you know the GNAP working group and some other other standard stuff all that said um she did do uh a lot of really important um sort of major surgery changes, sort of the first round of changes that was back in December, I think that was, that that got put in. And um, those changes uh, are going to pave the way for the next steps that we need to take with the draft. Um, so the biggest change is actually a dependency on structured headers. So the signatures now explicitly uses structured headers and uh, and not only to uh, present the signature, but also as a mechanism of signaling which components are signed. So as most of the people know in the group, the hard part is not signing a con the content. The hard part is getting the content in a state that you can actually sign it, uh, which is why it's here in the HTTP working group and not in um, one of the security area working groups, right? 
Um, so with, with that said, now that we have this based on HTTP signatures, our next steps are to uh, sort of further that canonicalization algorithm that's in here. So how you pick apart the different bits of the HTTP message and uh, put them into the signature base for both the um, HTTP client and HTTP server, so the sender and receiver side of, uh, of the signature bit. Um, I cannot speak to uh, Annabelle's availability in the immediate future, but this is work that um, is uh, that other things that I'm working on depends on. So I am actually going to plan to um, grab the pen and try to do uh, try to further sort of the steps that she had started back late uh, late fall, early winter and um, push those forward to the next step. So um, this is going to be, there's some open questions. We've got tons of open issues, but there's open questions on, you know, how do you indicate what was signed? How do you choose the algorithm and indicate the choice of the algorithm and protect that? Um, there's some stuff in here that got added about doing multiple signatures, which she presented at the last, um, at the last interim if you, uh, where we presented this, if you guys recall. Um, all of that's good stuff. It's all very, very rough in there right now. And, um, and it just, it, it needs a lot of fit and finish, um, for, for it to be really usable. Um, I have also not yet implemented, uh, this draft as, as it stands. Um, I have an implementation of the old cabbage signatures draft on which this was originally based. Uh, it's my intent to take that, which was built in Java, and um, uh, and update it to uh, to speak this. Um, that said, we have uh, received uh, a bunch of feedback from people sort of outside the HTTP working group who are really eager for this to exist. Um, so the Mastodon project has gone and taken this draft and then kind of forked it as as they do. Um, and, uh, so we'll be looking at, you know, what they've done in their fork and hopefully be able to bring that back into this eventual RFC, um, in the next steps. And, um, uh, yeah, so sorry, I don't really have more of an update. I wasn't, I wasn't really planning on making this, uh, presentation today. Um, not a problem, but that, that's fine. Well, thank, thanks for doing that at the last minute. Um. Uh, I'm a little concerned to hear that they've proactively forked it. It'd be great if we could encourage them to come and participate here. Um, it, it's not like it cost them anything. So, yeah, um, I agree. And we've, we've extended the invitation. So, uh, one of the co-editors, uh, Manic Sporty is, has ties into that community. Um, the thing with the Mastodon project, uh, if you're, if you're familiar with it at all, they're kind of their own ecosystem. And so it's, it's a de facto, whatever is implemented there is what everybody just has to use. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's not an intentional, like we're forking this for some philosophical reason. It's, this is just what we implemented in order to do what we needed to do. And so that's, that's stuff that, you know, ought to be considered and incorporated in here. And it would be, it absolutely would be best if they're here as part of the conversation. Um, I don't have direct ties into that community, but I know people who do. And so hopefully we can continue that outreach and, um, and bring that forward. I, Cause I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, the people that have been using cabbage in its several dozen, um, variations over, over the last decade, um, really should be, um, feeding that wealth of experience into this. Okay. Um, so it sounds like um, you, you've, you've hit a couple of bumps, but you're still working on it. Um, and you have a fair amount of, of encouragement to, to continue uh, and, and conclude pretty quickly. Um, so if there's anything we can do to help, uh, and especially if there are checkpoints that you'd like to get feedback from the working group or review of the document or answers to questions, please, you know, uh, bring it to the mailing list or talk to Tommy and I, and we can make sure that everybody takes a look at the right times. All right, we'll do. Um, yeah, for uh, you know, for the for the chair's benefit, largely, uh, my next plan is to do uh, 
an editorial pass over the document because there's a lot of language like you can see the this work was originally based on coverage and has been adapted blah 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 there's a lot of that stuff that just kind of needs to be editorially kind of cleaned up and excised now that this is a working group draft um so that's going to be my first step and then the second step is to uh sort of further the work that Annabelle started um when she moved everything to structured headers um and so the the whole construction bit and like signing the signing the declaration of what you're going to sign um those are those are pieces that were um missing from the input drafts and uh, are really really important to the security model of this so th those are those are my uh my plans with this draft i've also um i have reached out to annabelle and um ostensibly i'm going to be meeting with her next week sometime but um i'm I've been encouraging her to uh, to continue on this work. Uh, like I said, I don't know the details, but I just know that uh, she's been kind of pulled in other directions. Uh, as Fair enough. You know, it happens. It does happen. Yeah, uh, and and if you turn out, you know, you end up needing more help editorially, we can we can have a chat about that too. All right, um, we appreciate that. It, does anyone have any feedback or questions for Justin about this draft? Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys. Okay. Um, so before we go on, uh, it occurred to me, we probably need to make one more announcement, which is that, uh, we are having a change of area director. Not quite yet. At the next IETF, uh, we'll, we'll have a new area director. Uh, and so, uh, I'd like to thank Barry, uh, who's been our area director on and off for the last, what is it now? 15 years, something like that. Um, it, it's been a pleasure working with you, Barry. Um, thank you. And also to welcome, uh, Barry, can you actually, do you have a camera? How much people know what you look like? There you are. There's a camera. Hi. And, uh, Hi. it's been a pleasure working with you guys too. I'll miss you. Yep. But I'll be around. And our new area director is Francesca. Uh, if, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, who will be uh, officially taking over at the ITF meeting in March. So, hello and welcome. Thank you, thank you. Looking forward to it. Lovely. Okay. So next up we have Digest. And I believe we do have a presentation for that. Lucas? Yes. You... I yes. should have it in, in your GitHub repo. I do. I'm just doing magic with with Webex. Black magic. Mm. How's that? Uh, that looks cool. good to me. Um, so, yeah, uh, ideally Roberto would have been presenting here uh, because he's kind of taking point on um, some of the digest stuff that I'll be talking about today. He couldn't make it, um, that's life. So I'll do my best job of channeling um, his expertise in the area, but please do forgive me if I get caught up in the right terms for payloads and representations and whatnot. Uh, so this is digest headers, the replacement of RFC 3230. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, the last time we presented was back in October and we went through a few issues. Since then, um, it, what we've been working on is mainly editorial stuff uh, that's been sitting in the editor's copy. We haven't pushed a new update out uh, because we wanted to try and push on, on some of the more designy aspects. Um, so I wanted to say thanks to, to the folks that have given us a review, especially Julian, who's come in and given like a really deep analysis of some things. Um, and uh, even Sean was popping up recently to to kind of poke holes in our IANA process. So that's all really appreciated at this stage. Um, and we encourage people to keep doing that and we'll try and address those things as, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, and if anyone cares, you can click that link and it'll show you the current diff between the editor's copy and what the last draft was. Oh. 
uh, I mean, the, the talk always looks pretty bad, um, but here it's it's mainly, you know, hyperlinks to things, uh, going through the examples, making sure those are properly formatted, all the good stuff that we like to see. Um, there's probably still nits and problems with them. Um, I mean, on the face of it, those things look a bit like a structured header, but they're sadly not, and the ship sailed on that point. Um, but uh, that, that's it. Uh, so it does look like a lot of change, but I, I'd say none of it is super substantial. Um, but yeah, if we could go on to the um, back to the slides and, and talk about the things that kind of matter here. Uh, we, we've got two issues that we could use some input on. Um, the first of those is the one that's really a sticking point, I'd say, for us. So um, this is all about digests and requests. Uh, Oh, uh, I, yeah, let's just go on to the next slide and I'll try and explain what that means. Um, so the digest header can be used in requests and responses. Um, and to understand what that means, kind of a bit of historical context might help here for people not super familiar. So RFC 3230, it was called instance digest, but kind of ignore the instance stuff. Um, what we wanted to do is is update that document to reflect the terminology that RFC 7231 and whatever the new core drafts will be for semantics um, to try and capture how people think of HTTP today. Um, so that digest draft is is a standard um, and it's going to be updated or obsoleted by this document. I don't know the right term. I get confused. Um, but, but ultimately, um, it acknowledged some issues with content MD5, um, which was deprecated not by Digest, but by RFC 32, uh, 7231. Um, and this is mainly because people were inconsistently implementing content MD5 when it came to partial responses. That text is taken from the appendix. Um, uh, and so, but again, content MD5 could be used for request and response. So historically, there's been some issue where when you're calculating a hash of a payload body or content, like we might want to call it now, that uh, people make the wrong assumption about what, what the bytes are being hashed are. Is it a complete message? Is it a shirt? You know, that just causes interrupt problems. So digest kind of fixed a lot of those issues. Um, so go on to the next slide. And and so what we have at the moment um, is I'd say a bit of a um, difference of opinion between uh, Roberto and Julian and anyone who might want to pick a side on that on what does digest mean in relation to requests. For responses, it's fairly straightforward because we're familiar, we're used to now working with um, you know, range requests and getting partial responses back. But the digest of a request is a bit of a weird mental model. And so what we've got is this kind of cluster of issues. They're not all the same thing. They're all slightly different, but they're, they're related to us trying to get an answer to what we think we mean in this spec to say about digests on request bodies. Um, um, and I think if we can unstick that, it, it gets this document closer to being done. We've got a, a whole slew of other issues that we can just make progress on in the background, but we keep kind of circling back to this one. Um, so the next few slides are going to try and dig into this a bit more. Um, it might be a bit overkill, but let's just see what people think. Uh, yes. Uh, and so I just, just to ground this in reality, like, What's an example of where you might want to send a partial request uh, before the HTTP police come and, and arrest me on that and say you can't do that? Um, you know, the, the use case might be that you want to upload different ranges of a large file, um, and that could be to, to support a resumable upload model where I don't, you've got a gigabyte you want to upload and you're going to do it in little chunks across different connections or whatever and then at the end maybe try and um, verify that uh, maybe all of those trends were individually integrity okay and then you kind of wind them all up together at the end and and check the integrity of the whole thing um, 
And so that use case might want to use digest this specification to help that upload process to validate the integrity of some or all of those things. Um, and so today there are people doing this uh, for uh, you know things like cloud storage, um, and they don't, as far as I can see from the survey that I've seen, they don't use digest, but they use headers that are like digest in this in the case of like taking a a, a hash of a of a thing um, and having a process to transfer that to one from one side to the other and then validate that. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, um, it's kind of as part of the HTTP core work, I, I, I think I put this into um, some discussion on HTTP semantics. And so recently incorporated into section 14.4 and 14.5 is um, this text that says servers must ignore a content range on a request if a client for instance, is trying to put a, a partial um, resource um, with a language that no request method in the spec is defined to support content range. Uh, but meanwhile, it also says that partial put is kind of implemented by some people inconsistently and, and relies on private agreements. Um, so it's th this kind of helps in a way because until now, we didn't have anything in semantics that acknowledged what was happening. Um, I don't know if that shifts the needle on coming to a decision on anything, but it 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 it, it does give us a bit more insight, I'd say. Um, so we're going to the next slide. Um, and so uh, this table is probably oversimplifying the discussion, but it's kind of a, a high level view and it's also biased because it's from the authors of the digest spec. Um, and so if I'm giving any unfair um, weighting to digest compared to say Julian's view, I do apologize, uh, but but that wasn't the point. I'd like to, to get this table kind of filled out more properly in some way, whether it's just logically. Um, but you know, one school of thought here, the top row is that um, a digest in a request is always computed on the payload data. We, we ignore the possibility of any partial payloads in requests. Um, and so you, know, you get the whole thing. This is easier for, say, like a server to implement. Um, when it receives a request, it can just calculate a digest quite easily. It doesn't need to consider partiality. Um, and so that's that's fine, uh, but the the cons that we see with that is it's trying to resurrect some of the content MD five behavior, which was, um, as I showed earlier, kind of deprecated for a reason uh, because of that inconsistency of implementation. Um, and then same we've also got here is that it, there's an asymmetry between the way that um, the world views digest usage between request and response that that digest says it's about representations and it applies equally on request and response, but that we're applying this kind of rule that it doesn't within the constraints that we have from semantics today. Um, and, and yeah, but that's about the only cons I can think that I don't know if we can get over them because of the rules that like the corner we've painted ourselves into, but, but that's how we see it. Um, and the, the, if we look at representation data, maybe to put it into contrast, um, the pros that we we believe that if we apply the rules similarly to requests to allow partial requests, um, that we maintain the intent that RFC thirty two thirty had. Um, we we're not kind of revoking a contract of design that it was intended to have, even if no one actually used that so far. Um, what it gives us is a coherent definition of, of using digest across re requests and responses, um, independent of if there's any actually defined semantic yet that wants to use them or not. Um, and so what, by that, the pro is that we can come back um, and, well, sorry, we don't need to come back and do something different in digest to fix it. We'd like to do this once and kind of move on. Um, and there's some other things there I've probably already covered. Uh, there is a con here that um, you know, in intermediaries that implement digest for a partial request would need to be able to distinguish that 
and maybe they they can't based on the surveys that we've done and and the language and semantics um, and i you know, i don't know how we get over that one um so next slide please um I, there's a lot to digest there and i i fully appreciate people aren't like probably that closely tracking this um and i think that's par par partially why we, we're getting stuck on thing oh very funny jeffrey thanks I should have thought of that. Um, and so, so what I wanted to do is just put up a straw person um, argument here. Uh, not even an argument. It's not an argument. It's a path forward. Just, just some way to let us move on um, and unstick this and, and kind of get done with this. What we thought was a quick rewrite. Um, so, uh, and and this isn't you know if 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 anyone hates this just say, and we can come up with something else. Uh, but yeah, we, we can just agree that digest applies to request representation data, but actually there's nothing really defined today that would let anyone use that. Yes, there's this partial put um, use case, but it's not commonly solved. Um, um, the way that people use digest and request today is just to send the whole thing. Um, and sending the whole thing is is the same as sending the payload data. It's kind of equivalence and that's fine, but that we shouldn't prevent some future usage um, that the people might want to do. And so therefore, if needed, uh, somebody else can go and standardize partial requests and that activity should probably consider um, that if they want to do an integrity check of the payload data, that they need a new header that emulates what content MD5 did but gives the flexibility to use different algorithms that are actually safe to use today. Um, and that could be a, a similar format to digest, but with a, a different name and a different definition that makes it abundantly clear what it's there for. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's a suggestion. We're happy to take feedback or anything. Um, I see Martin's in the queue, and I think this is the point where we're going to accept any questions or clarification? I think Julian was first, actually. Oh, I do apologize. Hello? Hello. So um, I, I think it would be extremely helpful if we actually had real world examples for this. It's, it's really hard to argue about this about without something that we can look at and see a message exchange. So um, when you say the request representation data for a partial request, what is that? Yeah. Um, so I would say <laughs> uh, if you want to send um, a, a, a thing that is 10 bytes long, but you don't want to send the whole thing, uh, you want to put two bytes of it, then the digest that you would put uh, the digest you would include on their request message would be the digest of the whole 10 bytes, not the two bytes that you were sending in the payload data. What would that be useful for? Um, I don't know, but okay. by, by, the, by the law or by the intent that digest has, th this is the same as saying, well, if, if, I re if I do a head request for a file, and I don't get any bytes back, what was the point in receiving the digest on those bytes? Um, I, I don't want to kind of litigate on what people want to do, but I do fully appreciate the um, your comment that having a use case actually can help us figure out what we're trying to do here. So um, I'm absolutely with you that I don't want asymmetry. I want consistency. And if we can, I think we should try to get to have requests and responses treated the same way. So that are absolutely good goals. And, and maybe if, if you say, uh, you, you mentioned content MD5 and the confusion about what it applied to. I mean, um, I, I think that was a bug of the specs that defined it. So they never said, so nobody knew and some big one answer, some picked the other answer, and there was no interrupt. And um, the obvious answer is to pick one of these and, and to, to see which one makes more sense. And um, 
that, that's the discussion I'd like to see. I'm absolutely not yet uh, sold on the idea that if you do a range request on a resource, that the digest actually should apply to the full resource. Because if I have an HTTP library that checks digests, it can't check, check it because it doesn't see the full resource. So may, maybe my worldview about what this is about is misguided, but I have that idea that if I write an HTTP library and that I can flip a flag and say, check digests, and it can do that. And if we are hand wavy about what the digest applies to, and if that is something the HTTP library actually doesn't see, then I'm concerned. Because I would want that to be something that a component that builds an HTTP request and sends it, or a, com a component that receives a re uh, an HTTP request uh, can actually um, implement the spec. Yes, I I accept that point. I would say that having in a previous life used signet uh, used digest plus signatures, but let's ignore that part. Um, digest to effectively reassemble a um, a file that was retrieved using HTTP over different mediums to give an integrity check of mm -hmm. the the thing above any any kind of specific context. That was like an application level check based on HTTP metadata. Yeah. Um, that, that was useful for me to do, um, or further, you know, to be able to um, fetch the, you know, like do a head request to fetch the digest of a thing I want to check and prove that it, it is what I think it is, um, was also useful. Um, I, I agree that there is a use case here for integrity checking the actual payload that was sent in a message, but I, I think that's tangential or um, additional to the digest of the whole thing. Yeah, can, yeah but if, I, if you, yes. I understand the re reassembly thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you do, if you have, let's say, um, ten range requests to get a resource representation, whatever. And so uh, let, let's assume that you get the digests for each chunk. And then if you want to see whether what you reassembled is the correct thing, you can always do an head without a range and will get the, um, the digest for the full resource and you can check it locally. So I'm not sure whether flipping that to, it must be the full resource as opposed to it must be the payload, is the easiest answer because if we make it the digest of the payload, the answer for the non-chunked resource is, is in, in the head request that you can do and you will always get that. And we don't need two, that, two different things to send over the wire, two different header yeah. fields also. Can I suggest something? I, there's, right. there's literally no way that you'll ever resolve one or the other, it's impossible because different people have different use cases. So just label the ones you're defining as what, they're, what they are. If necessary, define two, two different header fields or two different parameters inside the one header field that describes what it is it's making a digest of. I, I don't, it's pointless to decide which one of these arbitrarily based upon who has the strongest argument for a use case. Um, yeah, I'd say what we've been trying to do is keep it in the spirit of what we understand um, RSC 3230 to, to do and be used today. Um, maybe that's not fully accurate. I don't know. It's hard to poll people. But I, my my understanding is that if we tried to, to turn it into what Julian said or, or suggested, um, that we, we kind of break a load of people who are using digests today. And that, I don't want to do that. Uh, we have Martin and then Justin in queue, and I, I don't think we said it explicitly before, but if you want to, to say something, please queue in the chat just by typing Q+. Um, go ahead, Martin. So um, I'm 
kind of swayed by Julian's comment here. Um, when, I, when I look at requests, there's, there's not a lot of cases that I'm aware of where you actually convey a representation. I think put might be the only case that we're concerned with. And then we're further only really concerned with this in the context of a partial put, which is kind of in the core specs now very clearly carved out as this sort of um, crazy, um, you're on your own territory. It's not really standardized in any way and explicitly so. So I was wondering whether or not the asymmetry is something that we can just live with not having in this case and say that the um, the digest applies to the to the um, content of the message as opposed to the representation uh, selected representation which is in most cases no different um, and so then we don't have to worry about posts we don't have to worry about uh, all of patch for instance which is a kind of a partial upload but it never really selects an, an individual rep representation uh, and so I think I think we're good um, if if we have the asymmetry and unfortunately um, the Julian's argument about what does an implementation do really kind of nailed it for me uh, the server when it produces a response has access to its view of what the selected representation actually contains. Whereas the client, when it makes a request, is always making an assertion about something that maybe exists, maybe doesn't exist. And so um, trying to address this for just put seems like it's not really necessary. Justin? OK, so. Um... As somebody who is very interested in using the spec as part of the whole signature stack, this is this is where we want to uh, get um, protection of uh, of body on put and post requests. Most specifically, could be used on responses, but my use cases are largely uh, driven by protecting the requests. And um, in these cases, the uh, it kind of boils down to the the semantic differentiation between this you know this partial representation versus representation. Uh, honestly, it just it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense from um, a developer perspective. Now, this might be because I'm still uh, a bit on the outside of all of the depth of HTTP semantics, and I understand why we're going in. Uh, we're using those to define um this new version of this spec and you know it's important to align that said uh reading the new version of the spec i got to the end of it without really understanding am i supposed to just take this byte array that i have and chuck that through the hash function or is there something that i need to do to it first because uh like you know similar to what julian was saying i'm um when I'm implementing this or when I have implemented this, it goes into a layer in um, in my library functions. And it's just, here's the HTTP message that uh, the, you know, this request object that I want you to make, you know, here it's got a method, it's got a URL, it's got a body, it's got some headers, do some magic and add this digest header to it. And then there will be another step that says, do some other magic and add a signature header to it. And so I need to be able to understand what exactly that magic is in order to have the, uh, the appropriate layers and libraries put those pieces into place. That's really hard to do right now. Um, Brian Campbell posted an issue to that effect uh, back in December as well. Um, and um, you know, I, what, I didn't join in in the conversation at the time, but you know, reading back through it, in the background, I agree with a lot, a lot of that. How do we fix that going forward and still align with HTTP semantics? I don't rightly know. Um, but ultimately, we do need this to be very precise and very clear about what do I do? What is that magic that I need to put into that implementation of a digest function and therefore of my signature function you know, uh, in order to actually use this blasted thing. 
So I want to use it. I want it to exist. Um, thanks, Justin. Like, it's great to hear these kinds of comments. Um, like, I agree that the 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 kind of the input that Brian um, gave us earlier in the year um, was very helpful because you kind of um, forget how people might just read the draft and and use it. I'd say that the the, the trouble here is that it's it is really hard to get your head around and. Uh, I think there's always editorial improvements that document can, can take, and I'm probably sounding defensive, but um, the fact that it's hard doesn't mean we're wrong. Like, it, getting this right is very tricky, and what we've tried to do is use existing terminology and replace what Instance Digest was doing. Um, maybe we got it wrong. I don't know. But um, I think if, if you think through the perspective of uh, your a HTTP um, layer that is going to take some some response or some file you have on the system and return that uh, there's probably going to be a layer that's going to do some content negotiation and maybe encode it based on what the ui asked uh, for uh, so the ua asked for and and in in this case representation digest which is what we labeled this spec to start with um, that value would vary based on the content negotiation uh, not transferring coding that that complicated things on the top and um, I, I'd say like if if we get too far back to how people think this might work in the easy case we risk treading back to like content md5 and getting it wrong and ending up without interoperability um, um if uh, if I may just quickly follow up thanks um yeah, I, I agree that the uh, that the complex cases where you have multiple representations of content encoding and you're doing stuff with files makes this harder. And I absolutely get that you need to under that you guys need to solve the general case for this, um, and that's hard. And I'm glad you're doing it, and not me. <laughs> um, but uh, the the thing is, um, so from my perspective, most of the stuff that I need to sign is going to be created in memory by calling json object dot to string and passing that into a rest template or you know url lib or something like that as as a byte array or as a string and that's what i'm going to be working on there there is no file there is no negotiation especially on the request side right it's just this is the thing that i am sending you and I need to cover that in this protected envelope somehow. And I, I need to have a really clear way to protect that. Um, so this may honestly be a case, and you know, I think the, the partial put argues for this as well, that as elegant as parallelism is, and I'm often generally a fan of it, this may be a place where they're not actually parallel because they are different kinds of operations like the information you have available to you as an http client versus an http server um is not going to be the same and uh, this spec may need to take that into consideration there there may be natural asymmetry i'm not saying that there necessarily is but there may be cool uh, i just just to very quickly respond in this case something you you might be able to do in 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 what we introduced in in this digest spec is the um what we call the ID uh, hash algorithm. So that, that would always be um, clear in the header that you are calculating a digest over the the identity representation. So it doesn't matter what it looks like on the wire. So um, it, the, it, the other side always knows to take off any encoding and kind of go back to identity encoding, which isn't a thing, but okay, whatever. Um, and, and then do the validation on that. Um, which can help mitigate some of these issues. But but absolutely, thanks thanks for the feedback. Um, and if there's any specific suggestions you have on how we can make things clearer, like please please um, do them while they're fresh in your head. Thank you. So I heard, I guess, two things go by there. One was Julian wanted to see more examples. <clears throat> I think that would be really helpful um, because sitting here thinking about this, I'm not entirely sure that I believe that the, the payload digest is the one you want. If there are partial puts, um, there are going to be cases where it's important to protect the integrity of 
the whole resource, the, the whole representation. And indeed, there are some attacks that could take place if you don't do that. Um, so we, we probably need to work with those use cases. And, and Roy made the suggestion in chat, which I'll just make sure people see, which was maybe we need two headers, one for digest and one for content digest. And, and that might be something to consider. Yeah, and, and that, that's something that's, that's kind of come up in GitHub discussion as well. And my question to the chairs or the working group would be, do we feel that that's something that has to be done as part of this digest work? Or is that something that could be done um, separately? Uh, I, I'd ask the question slightly different. I, I think it could be done as part of this if we wanted to. I don't think that it being abyss constrains us from creating a new header with similar semantics. Um, the question is whether we want to. Uh, uh, my my question was more: Is is the, is this thing undeployable without the two? Uh, I just want to check my my gauging of the work. Is there a significant pushback that like this is fine? Okay, this digest did exist, but this work has revealed that actually it's kind of a bit broken, and we need we need something else. Julian and Brian, thank you. So, um, if I understand correctly, the way this spec was born was uh, by the wish to fix the old digest spec to be consistent with current specs and so on. And um, maybe we need to realize that the way that spec was written itself in itself was so ambiguous that um, we can't fix it without breaking somebody's implementation. So maybe uh, a better approach would be actually to say we are guided, inspired, whatever by this old RFC, but we are ready to, to we don't need to be compatible with it. We just define different header fields and try to get those right instead of trying to be compatible with something that's as far as I understand, doesn't work in practice. But um, I mean, I hear about implementations using digest, but um, do they really exist? Are they widely deployed? Is that a private agreement between a specific server and a specific library? I have no idea. So I think we need to test the assumption that being compatible with that spec in some way is necessary. Thanks, Julian. Uh, we've got Brian, and I think we need to wrap this up. We're, we're a little bit over time. We do have some slop in the schedule, but we need to move on pretty soon. Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow up. I'm not even sure exactly how to express it, but for for the sort of regular person that might come to this, I, I would ask again that even if it is made to be um, the not the body, the, the potential parcel representation. If if the digest spec could be more clear and declarative about when and where one can understand what the actual content being fed into the digest is, it would be really helpful. And I understand there's a new semantics document. I understand this is a rewrite of that. But I'm and I'm I'm not deep into HTTP, but when I came into this, it it was um very, very difficult to grok what the expectation of the, the digest header was and thinking about that as it would be applied to some kind of signature scheme where I believe most people's expectations is similar to what, what Justin described, like a signature over the message itself. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that it be something else, but at least being clear in the in the document for for regular people to be able to consume when that is and isn't the case and even possible would be super helpful. Um, I know that's not super actionable because I'm asking you to describe it for me because I don't understand it, but um, I, I don't think I'm alone in the world of people that won't instantly grok this and it, it would be, yeah, it would be really helpful. And more examples would also be helpful, but I came to, to the issue repository trying to understand it and running across the examples that then actually weren't a digest of what was in the example. So making sure those are done, added and done correctly would be also helpful. Um, sorry, that was kind of rambling, but 
No, no, Brian, like, th thanks for um, reaching out and actually engaging here. The examples is unfortunate. We broke that. That was due to kind of a classic reformatting and flowing um, activity. But like, I am very sympathetic that this is hard to just come to and say, oh, there's this header. I need to figure out how to validate it or how to produce it. Like, I, I really would like to make things more accessible, but I think like, I don't want to have to describe all of semantics like there's there's a big draft that does all of this and I, i'm willing to to work on that but um it is tricky and we i, we, I get it i recognize that too um so maybe maybe and maybe i'm asking too much i don't know but you know at least getting being specific about the areas of semantics that are relevant how they might impact it um at least getting the links um you know, there's some broken rings right now in the references that, that makes it all that harder to try to backtrack and figure out where things are going on, getting working examples. Um, yeah, it would, I get it. I'm, I, those are just areas of feedback that I think would be, would be really useful. Um, and I think it, I, potentially another header that does more of just a dumb payload digest would be useful, but I, I, I'm not sure it's even strictly necessary if, if, if we can kind of get to understanding when and when not, this is applicable to the kind of use cases we've been looking at. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry, again, not very actionable. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks for reading and commenting. That's all I can say. <laughs> Gen <laughs> genuinely, it's appreciated. Okay, so maybe we should move on to the the next issue um, and, and try and speed up a bit. Uh, if we've got time, otherwise I can I can probably skip this one if if it helps you. Um, I don't think we're time constrained, so if you can do it, but just in like five minutes, maybe. Absolutely. Yep. So next slide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. So this is a completely different thing to like how how do you calculate whatever based on weird semantics no one can find the terms for. Uh, instead, this is issue 1377, which is uh, how to deal with old algorithms. So what we, we currently have is uh, an IANA table that's out there and existing. Um, and the digest draft we have today wants to change some of that. So I don't want to like put the whole table here, but to give a summary, uh, what we're going to do to that table is alongside the algorithm listing name, create a column that has a status um, to indicate, you know, that actually a lot of the algorithms that are there, that they're, they're not defined by digest, but they, they are used in digest to calculate the digest, but that we are kind of saying they're all don't use them. Uh, but like you can see here, we've got different statuses. We have standard, uh, deprecated, uh, obsoleted, and a special obsoleted. Like there's not a consistency in in the on a table that we would make out of this document. And personally, I don't think that really helps much. Um, we have had um, questions about, oh, well, you know, should, should we stop recommending MD5? Yeah, well, great, we can. Um, but what about Unix? Um, like it was inconsistent. Like I'm not saying but we're not saying Unix um, here is better than MD5. They're, they're probably all broken. The people who who might use um, MD5 classically wanted something that was more secure and a stronger hashing algorithm, but it busted. And maybe, you could argue that maybe they were using it in a context um, that they thought it was better than Unix. Um, but I don't know. It's it's kind of lots of what ifs, shoulda, coulda, wouldas here. So uh, we've gone to the next slide. Um, the things we can control is that the, the statuses that we're defining or allowing in, in this document are, are really confusing. There's no pattern I can find in them. I think we've kind of organically grown based on different issues that have come up to say, oh, let's deprecate that one and obsolete this one. Um, and, and coming back to this, I was just instantly confused by it. So for the sake of, of just simplicity, uh, if we go into the next slide, I think to, to help resolve this issue, what I'd like to do is just obsolete everything except known decent algorithms, SHA-256, SHA-512, um, and say everyone must not use the other ones, but knowing that they, 
they probably will if they want to. The digest spec is weird in that, say you provide a digest header on a response for a thing. There's no requirement to do anything with that. You, the, the, the server could provide three different digest values with different algorithms that don't match um, when they're, they're verified. And, and there's like the existing language is pretty loose. And again, if we change that, we risk not reflecting reality or breaking older um, implementation. So, so my suggestion is just to make things simple for people reading the spec to say, I shouldn't use those things. Okay, understood. Um, and that's, that's it on this issue. I wonder what people think about that proposal. Um, and if, if they think it's okay, then I will um, land the PR to do that. Mark, you're in here. So I, I queued, um, yeah, every IANA registry deals with this problem. Um, you, you are not alone. Uh, the, I, I think this is a fine approach. It's it, keep it simple. Just two different statuses is great. The only thing I'd say is you might want to consider using deprecated rather than obsoleted because obsoleted has special meaning in the ITF process. Um, but, but no strong feeling about that. That makes sense. Uh um, that's cool. The, the one question I've got here is that our designated expert, um, I think James Manger, I might have got the name wrong there, um, and their role in the um, modification of IANA, where they, they've, they've interacted a bit on the GitHub issues in the past, but um, it's been a bit quiet. And I wonder kind of how much toe treading we might be doing here, but we could probably resolve that off, off list. So, so the management of, you know, when we're revising the R RFC, the management of the registry is the pleasure of the working group in terms of the policy applied. Um, and we can have a discussion about that, whether designated expert is still the right approach or not, if we want to. I might want to talk about how um, we enable it to be managed on GitHub rather than the other processes, but that's neither here nor there. Um, the, the expert themselves, and it can be one or more people, is designated by the area director. And if we, we feel like we need an uh, expert, we can talk to the area director about that, or we can talk to James. James is still around. Uh, he still participates in IETF stuff. He's just quiet sometimes. So, but we can we can talk about that. So a quick question. I'm not too um, um, sure about all the dynamics around oh. this. Sorry, sorry. Mar Martin was in queue next. Okay, all right. Sorry about Let's that. Let's use the chat for queue management. Thank you. Oh, uh, okay. Sure. Martin? So um, the TLS working group, sort of already trodden this ground. Um, they have a recommended yes or no column. Maybe that's the way we can deal with this if you want a different way to spell it. Um, but I think this is the right thing to do. The fact that we had told people not to use MD5 but were perfectly okay with Unix sum was bizarre <laughs> to my, <laughs> my understanding. Uh, and this, this matches the sorts of uses that we're seeing from people nowadays. Um, the sort of things that Justin and, and Brian have been talking about doing here really does depend on a cryptographic um, hash. So I think this is the right the right outcome here. Cool. I see a plus one to that, and another plus one. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So did you want to comment? So um, as I said, I'm not too uh, sure uh, if I understood the whole dynamics around this um, digest thing, but I know Git uses SHA-1 hashes, right, for their whole tree structure and all, right? Git version control system. Yeah, that's true. They use SHA-1. Yeah, yeah. And, and also in web archiving world, we have been using SHA-1 hashes for like the last two decades plus, basically. Every time we archive a page, um, we create SHA-1 hash and shove it in the in the work record here, basically. Um, and I don't see that listed here, at least not in the standard part of it. Is it SHA is SHA-1? Yeah, SHA is SHA-1. And okay, uh, and the reasons that we wouldn't recommend that uh, uh, are abundant. Uh, I think that the, those people who are, who are using it still, because they have legacy, um, need, need to be very careful about how they use the the algorithm, but if it is just an integrity check, it's still actually okay. Uh, yeah, but the difference the here is what we're trying to recommend it uh, for use use in. And if you're using SHA, uh, for instance, as a K 
key in order to find things and you're worried about collisions, then it's totally not appropriate to do that if you have any adversarial um, content involved. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in, in GET, they, they use it both for uh, integrity and it also kind of indexes the data. They generally don't find, I mean, there were, I, I know there were, were like, you know, um, uh, attempts to uh, create collisions intentionally but um the anyways it's it's a little it's a little too late to fix like 20 years of work basically in in web archiving world for example going forward maybe tools adopt to uh, more modern uh, hashing algorithms uh, but then everything needs to kind of you know uh, work backward in that case oh that's it that's it from my side yeah okay um, I think we need to move on unless folks have other feedback. Um, Luke, if you have two more slides, you want to go through real quick? Uh, I can't remember what they are. Go, let, let's have a look. Thanks. Thank, thanks. And backlog. Okay, cool. Yeah, so so just on that backlog one, because it's kind of come up, we, we had this ID prefix thing for identity encoding, and it's, it's kind of nice, but it's a bit, it's the one part of the spec that's new. Um, and so there was a suggestion, well, actually, maybe it would be nice to um, take it out and, and make a spec or, or some language that would allow an ID prefix on, on any algorithm so that it was clear that it was um, done on the, the identity encoding. Um, I, I don't need an answer right now. I, I think I wonder what people want, given that we just said we want to obsolete all the rest of them. Um, it's not necessarily an issue. But, but for the future, it could be, uh, given how much interest there may or may not be in digest. So if people care, like go and have a look at the ticket and comment. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Again, for the second time. OK. So now we will move on to the cookies draft. Please. And for this, we have just added two new editors. Uh, so uh, before we had Mike West and and uh, John Moylander, and they are being uh, joined by Lily Chen and Stephen Engelhart. So uh, to, to to get this draft over the line and shipped. So so welcome to the process. They're they're they've been participating on the GitHub issues for a while, and now they're they're they're, they're editors. Uh, Lily, I think we have slides from you. Uh, yeah, they should be linked in the um, notes. There we go. Or, yeah, there, there they are. Okay. We just make them the right size. Lovely. Okay, take it away. Yeah, hi. So I'm Lily. Um, I work for Google. I work on Chrome primarily on cookies. Um, and so I'm uh, really honored to be joining the editor team for 6265BIS, um, along with uh, Stephen, who I'll let introduce himself. Hey, Stephen Engelhart. Uh, I work for Mozilla, and I primarily work on privacy features here. And so certainly those often overlap with cookies, but there's also many aspects of cookies which which are kind of uh, outside that scope. So I'm super excited to, to be jumping in and helping out. Um, next slide, I guess. Yeah, and I can kind of give a, a, a brief overview of where we're at right now. So we have 29 open issues, um, and there's a bunch that we think are not really in scope, in scope for this initial, uh, or for, for the work that we'd like to complete. And I think these fall into to some categories that basically either uh, lack consensus or they need more work. And it's things like the future of cookies, and will you still have access? And, and like specifying how how uh, access to third party cookies will look in the various implementers. And I think that's something that's just we don't have consensus around yet. Um, also in that zone are kind of some proposals for changes to security mechanisms. I think that that needs more work. Uh, and then a bunch of topics around cookie expiration and eviction. I think there's some differences between implementers there and. Uh, none of that has really gotten traction such that like we're ready to bring it into to this effort. Um, so for those issues at the top, uh, we think they should be deferred or closed. And I think if people object it, it would be good to know. Uh, and then the interop issues, we'll, I'll discuss in a little bit more detail on the next slide. 
Uh, but aside from that, we have some editorial things we need to make, uh, changes we need to make. And then Lily, later on in the presentation, will go through uh, the kind of progress we've already made and hopefully the things we've already resolved. Uh, so next slide, please. And so, so the interop issues fall into th that we'd still like to to work on fall into these like three broad categories. Uh, we know there's some issues around syntax and parsing of cookie and set cookie headers. Uh, I think this is both where like we actually need uh, alignment between implementers and also I think areas where the spec could be more specific. Uh, and one area that's like I think very difficult in the spec is. There isn't really a good description of how non-HTTP APIs should retrieve cookies. Uh, and so I think it's particularly evident around same site. And so there's been a bunch of questions around around that, um, but also just in general. Uh, and I think the approach we're, we're thinking to take there is to take what is currently like a, here's how you build a cookie header algorithm, uh, make it a little bit more generic so you could hook into it from a non-HTTP or an HTTP API. Um, and then you know attempt attempt to work out the details from there. So that's that's yet to be done. Uh, and then there's some domain attribute semantics that we still need to work through. Uh, and this is things like what happens when the PSL changes, um, what happens if the domain attribute is empty, or uh, what happens if localhost is specified. Specified. So uh, these are things that aren't specified in the spec and, and that we'd like to have there. And so we need to figure out where all the implementers fall and also where we want the spec language to go. And so I'll hand it over to Lily uh, to talk about what we've done so far. Thanks. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so some of the things that have happened recently, um, some issues that uh, we've either resolved or are in the process of resolving. Um, there was an issue about parsing of multiple same site attributes. So. Um, Let's say you had same site equals lax, same site equals garbage, same site equals lax again. Um, like, how would that be parsed? Um, and so the resolution was um, Firefox uh, aligned their behavior with Chrome and Safari, um, which was to take the last attribute. Um, and that's already consistent with what the spec says, but um, maybe it could be a bit clearer. Um, and another issue that we're working on is same site versus cross site requests with respect to redirects. Um, and so there is a PR open right now that considers the redirect chain in the definition of same site request. Um, and that is uh, pretty much ready to be merged, um, I think. Um, and then another issue is same site versus cross site requests with respect to reload requests. Um, and there is also an open PR to address that, um, which defines different behavior for a reload request that is initiated by um, a user agent's uh, UI interface. Um, and lastly, there was an issue about um, the request method on redirects with respect to same site. For example, um, a post that redirects um, into a get and so there was um, a PR that clarified the method, uh, clarified the method of the current redirect top is used there. Um, next slide, please. And then also since the last interim meeting, um, we had a call for adoption for sections 3.1 to 3.3 of the cookie incrementalism ID. Um, and there was strong support for that. So thank you to everyone who gave feedback on that thread. Um, and we ended up merging in three sections of the cookie incrementalism draft into 6265 bis, which were treating cookies as same site equals lax by default, um, requiring secure for same site equals none, and um, introducing schemeful same site cookies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then lastly, just to give an update on the web platform tests, um, thank, thanks to Mike Taylor, um, rewrite of the HTTP state test suite um, originally by ABARTH is complete. Um, and so there are new tests um, for each of the cookie attributes um, and you can see the results from 
um, a recent run on WPT.FYI. Um, so the old tests never really worked um, and the new tests work now. <laughs> so uh, thanks again to Mike. Um, and I believe that's it. Great. It's, uh, I'm really happy to hear about the test cases. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so it's, it's good to hear that it seems like this, this draft is uh, picking up some steam. Uh, if there's anything uh, that you need from the working group in terms of feedback or, or input, please uh, feel free to ask. If you need any support from the chairs, you know, if you want to set up a, a regular meeting for the editors or anything, uh, likewise. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions on this draft? Okay. Well, once again, welcome. Okay. Uh, next up, we have H two this, which is Martin Thompson. That would be me. Oh, you did it again. Oh. <laughs> you you have to prepare yourself for many more. Uh -huh. The legacy of Mr. Bishop. Yes. All right, go for it. Yeah, so um, not a lot to report here. The next slide has the details. Uh, we submitted a new version of the draft. It has many business in it, uh, too many. Um, but probably the, the good news is that uh, Corey is joining me to help on the work, and we've already made some pretty good progress on some of the editorial things that are I mean, probably the big thing that we're working on right now is making sure that the text lines up with the changes to the semantics uh, terminology. And so we're working through that in the moment. Uh, but what we're here today to talk about is some of the issues that we've got. Uh, the next slide has a link. That's where we're going. Hopefully this is gonna be readable for everyone because Mark's screen is huge. So I wanted to go through these maybe one at a time. And you recommended the screen, Martin, by the way. Yeah, it's a good screen. Yeah, let's try this. How's that? Readable? It's manageable. I, I can make out the words. Okay. Uh, I don't know what people's preferences are. My preference is probably to go through the probably not ones, because I think we've got some fairly good sense of that and I'll try to record some conclusions from the discussion here. Can we talk about 788, which is the static table. I don't think anyone ever wanted to do this. Uh, and so if anyone wants to speak up for doing this, which by the way requ requires that we revise HPAC as well as HTTP2, um, then speak your piece. This implies a lot of other things, probably it's a bad one to have picked first. Um, but I think I think we're in a position to, to close this one. I'm hearing a lot, well, at least some no on the chat channel. I'll, I think that to do this properly, we'd need a new version. So the, the bar is behind. And Corey says strong no as well. Right. Oh, so we got fully on screen. <laughs> We, we need a, a new version of the protocol in order to, to do this at all. And um, there's a lot of people who are unwilling to do even that. So I think what we'll do is we'll say that we talked about it and we might uh, confirm on the list, but not do it. That's it, yeah. I'm, yeah. Gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and close the issue with this though. Okay, great. 787 is a similar one. Uh, people were talking about incompatible changes. But I haven't seen any of the issues that we've talked about uh, requiring of one. And this one was a little more mixed. Who actually wanted this one? <laughs> I'd almost, when you're, 
I think Ian was the stand bearer for this. That's correct. Um, I, I should we leave this until we find some reason to consider changing it? I mean, at, at the current time, I don't think we have any impetus for this change. Um, right. but if Ian wants to bring something to the, to the group for consideration, we can talk about that, and that might trigger a new AP, ALPN version. But I think the bar for doing this, based on the way we charted this and the discussion to date, is, is relatively high. Roy brings up in the chat, you know, should we address this at the end of it now? And to some degree, yeah, you can't answer this. I mean, I, I don't think we should spend any time on this. Like, whatever, whatever we need to do in the GitHub issue to say, Nope, unless something crazy changes, let's do that. Yeah, my, my sense here is that we haven't discovered the reason yet, but if we do, then I guess the option is always available to us. Okay. Yep. Uh, cut server push? Yeah. Wow. There are some people who really want to do this. So Mark talked about changing the defaults. That requires a change to the ALPN, funnily enough, uh, which is maybe a reason to do this. Uh, don't know. I think this one was one of those ones that was on the cusp in terms of defining what, what it is that we wanted to do or not. Well, um, no, what I suggested was to send settings enable push zero by default and then making it an extension. That was my suggestion. Yeah, which is essentially what um, what Corey suggests in the comment there. It would require a new ALPN in order to have it be the default. But a lot of implementations can send that themselves on their own cognizance anyway. So, so we could say you should send it unless you really need it. That would unless you really need that it. would be just what people do anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Those yeah, ones are. I, the, my comment was more if we factored server push out into an extension into a separate document to give a little more separation from HTTP2 um, and, and just say the document always said setting enables push unless you support this extension. Um, but I, I, I'm aware that that would cost some editorial work. I, I think that's all it would do, frankly. I'm, I'm not enthusiastic about doing that. Um, just looking through the text here real quick. So this was, I think we, we are kind of moving towards this is adding a note or adding some context about the, the, the use of the feature to make it clear that this doesn't really have, it, it, it can have some pointy edges and, and it's not terribly well used in a lot of cases. Uh, so we have some queue. We have Ian and then Lucas. Uh, go for it, Ian. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think we're removing this at this point. If we're not sorry, if we're not going to remove it entirely, moving it to an extension doc is is probably just work. It's probably just churn and more confusion than it's worth. Um, you know, I, I think I think adding some notes um, and maybe uh, you know there are notes both in, in the context of APIs that are typically available in web browsers. I not a particularly rich set, um, as well as notes about the pointiness of use and caching limitations and such that we've kind of learned since it was originally launched um, would be hugely helpful. Um, you know, so I think, and and the fact that it may not be supported by all clients, I, I think I think calling out all those things would be would be helpful and kind of add the context that we've gained since it was originally added. Lucas? Uh, I'll, I'll just agree with sort of Ian's points there that like, Pointing out that the APIs and the tooling and the debugging of push is like pretty bad might might help something. Getting that text right is probably difficult, but I'm happy to review stuff there. But the the bigger point I wanted to say is I think I agree with um, Martin's comment about the editorial work required for this. I, I, it seems ingrained in the state machine, and so by extracting out into an extension, just the busy work required to redraw that state machine and get it right, like. It already has some bugs in it that I've seen have been addressed by Martin and Corey. So I, I, I don't see the point. I'm not against recommending to default disable it or whatever, but I, I'd say leave it in this document personally. 
Eric. I think default disabling it would be totally reasonable. Just anecdotally, whether we're talking about inside a browser or outside a browser, I'm not seeing hardly anybody using it, um, at least on Apple platforms. So we, we can talk about disabling it. We can do a ton of editorial work or very little editorial work. Um, but it seems like the the much of the chicken and egg problem of getting it deployed has sailed. And so the the longer we keep it around, the, the more we're extending that maintenance work forever. But if we just say, you know, should say, should send the setting for don't use it and people just turn it off, then the only cost is there's extra text in the spec. Um, Mike Bishop's in the queue next, but I want to insert a clarification. I believe that when we're talking about defaulting to uh, not to, to not setting it, uh, what we mean is that by is explicitly setting the setting with a value of zero, uh, because changing the defaults in in the true meaning of changing a default would require a new LPN, and I don't think we're talking about that. Um, if anybody disagrees with that, please say so. But that's where I think we're at. Mike, go ahead. No, I, I think it's totally reasonable to say you should disable it unless you support it. That's just a clear announcement of your future set. Um, Akamai uses it. We do see some benefit, but it's small, and I know a lot of people are not able to use it successfully. So, yeah. But um, let's default it to off and move on. Okay. Um. I'm happy to work on a PR for that because uh, I've written a lot about pushing the pass mark. If you'd like, that would be that would be really good. I, I can write the same sort of thing, but uh, if you have yeah. the context, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Any other feedback on this issue? This was always going to be the hard one. So yeah. That's oh, good. That's right. uh, let's. We can probably make an editorial issue rather than mm -hmm. carry on here. Because it sounds like the resolution is going to be editorial. Okay. Can we go to the probably ones next? Those are the ones probably. that I th think. Though I think my sense is that we, we want to do these things. So 790, uh, Lucas, suggests that uh, we provide some more advice about how to design new fields to take bene the benefit of compression. And we probably want to look at structured fields here as well in terms of describing the, the, the rules here. Um, so my only concern here is where we can put it, where it'll actually get read. It won't get read. It's in a... Damned RFC. Yeah. Well, would this go in HPAC or, or in H2Biz or somewhere else? I think we could make this go in h 2 biz easily enough. It's There's a whole section on doing fields, so we could talk about that, but it's a bit weird, yeah. Um, my only, I guess my only other concern is Explaining this in a way that's actually usable takes a fair amount of text. And do we really want to add that much text to the spec? It's a good point. Maybe an appendix? Mm, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm happy to go and try and condense that blog entry and see if it's usable. Um, and it'd have to be much less narrative than the current blog entries, I think. Right. So I think the, the main, the main consideration here is, um, simply having, using the comma separator for individual pieces and, and making sure that you are able to reuse those pieces. But, um, that could only be a couple of paragraphs if, if you want to go that far, I don't know. Maybe Lucas can propose some text. Lucas, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify. This is like one of those classic drive-by comments when I was just like flicking through the spec and and saw this weird section on cookie crumbling that I I kind of always forget about and then read and uh, I'd recently read Mark's blog like so it was all in my head at the time. I don't even remember creating this issue. So I think like I could probably live without anything being done, but it's an opportunity to maybe help guide people who are doing things. I don't know when you're defining a. A field? Are you really reading a version-specific document? Uh, probably not. I don't know. Uh, Is it? I, 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 I struggle to put this in core. Well, that's probably where it should go because that's where the advice for new headers is. Yeah, that that suggests to me that maybe we don't, um, unless we manage to get something that's really good. Can we flip this to editorial? Sure. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll take a little to do of trying to condense that text into something more spec like. And then we can figure out whether we want it to live somewhere and if so, where. Does that make sense? So just, just to add then, is, is this a case that we might want to extract the cookie crumbling text out as well? Maybe. Ask, does that still belong in H2? Oh, it, unfortunately, the. The joining of multiple cookies uh, needs to remain in the spec because yeah. you use a semicolon rather than a comma, and people yeah. need to know that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the next one I think I've already flagged as editorial. It was a misclassification. It shouldn't appear, appear here. Um, the last one is 770, which talks about frames with multiple errors. Um, it turns out that there's a number of ways in which people can encounter errors in the formatting of frames. Maybe they're, bit, maybe they're too long. Maybe they contain a stream ID that doesn't exist and should, those sorts of things. Um, and the text says, use this error for this uh, error code for this error and use this other error code for this other error. And doesn't really provide any guidance about how to resolve conflicts where there are two different error codes that you might want to send. Um, my proposal here, I think, was to pull in some of the quick text that talks about error handling. Um, but that does actually require normative changes to the way that we structure the error reporting. Shouldn't affect interop, but it, it will affect how people handle their, their errors. Does anyone have any problem with making a change in this area to, to clear things up. I'd, I'd be a little wary of, of you know, it, it, is this an interop issue or is this just a, a someone wants deterministic behavior um, with with the errors that they get in their logs? I'm, I'm reading a lot of the requests in this area as people being un, unclear about this in terms of I've got the following inputs, what output should I expect into deterministic output? Yeah. And the, the people work on H2 spec and, and whatnot have always had problems with the spec in this regard. Corey's in the queue. Yeah. Uh, Corey, do you want to? Um, I don't think I meaningfully disagree with Martin in a Martin's assessment here. I do want to note that the error handling text in the um, quick document may not necessarily be all that helpful here, not least because it explicitly says an endpoint may use any applicable error code when it detects an error condition, which doesn't necessarily help us at all. Uh, if we really did want to establish a hierarchy of error codes, we could. It would seem like the easiest thing to do would be to say connection errors, trump stream errors, and uh, if you have multiple errors at the same level, use the one with the lowest numerical identifier. I mean, it, it, in many ways, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think the practical answer is that you can see any of the errors that might trigger. Um, you would hope that connection errors, trump stream errors, but you might not get it um, in, in practice. I definitely think we should be clarifying here, but I suspect that anyone who wants real determinism out of this clarification is not going to get it. Uh, so the whole point of the quick change was to remove any hope of determinism for, for those people who yeah. are seeking it. 
while I'm here, I will also object to um, the use of the phrase the most appropriate error code with no clarification of what appropriateness might mean. <laughs> exactly. All right. I think we can yeah, probably work on something in that in that area. Okay. We'll get a pull request together and we can talk about the pull request. So now we've got a bunch of things. How much time do we have, Mark? Um, say 10 minutes, maybe. Okay. So let's see if we can do a quick pass through the things that I was unsure about. Jeffrey opened 789 on connection specific header fields. Specifically about upgrade. Why anyone would send upgrade is beyond me, but. I noticed now that that Jeff, your issue says the update header field, not upgrade. Was that it was upgrade, wasn't it? It was I do not know. Okay. We can take a look here real quick. I will go look. No, it was upgrade. It was it very was specifically upgrade, upgrade yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks like we've got a case of uh, an intermediary acting more like a tunnel than an intermediary, and we're seeing the consequences of that. Sorry, do you want to speak up? Is it, is it reasonable to read Jeffrey's original issue as? basically pointing out that we have specified a behavior that does not appear, the majority of browser user agents don't appear to actually implement. Do we know what the current state of the browser user agents is here? Has anyone converged on Safari's behavior since this issue was filed? And if not, I think this is the standard W working group question, which is to what extent are we required to document widespread non-conformance to specification? In this instance, I'm inclined to say it probably doesn't matter if everyone actually does accept this and the spec says you shouldn't. I mean, it's on the client end, I don't think it, I don't think there are huge risks here, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to, to say this is mostly a do nothing and file some bugs against implementations that don't conform. Yeah, I was thinking the same. Yeah. Yeah. We'll leave that in the uh, do nothing box. Okay. 781. So after having gone through this exercise, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, seems like no one else wants to do it either. So that's probably good. So. I Demonstrate that it's possible, but I don't think it's something that people want to do. So I think we're probably in the in the bucket of well, that'd be nice, but too much work. Okay, uh, so go ahead and close this, and if people yeah. feel differently, they can comment, and we can reconsider it later down the road. As as always, but keeping in mind that later down the road is not very far because it's a short road, short path. Not, not a lot of time before we're going to finish this thing. Okay. The hard one, 773. So I actually wrote a pull request on this one, which went through and articulated a proposal. And then it was pointed out to me that that wasn't in the original scope of the work that we're taking on, uh, which is probably just my fault because I didn't actually check when the chairs passed that, that email by me. Uh, I was on holidays. Uh, and so, yes, 
So the, the the pull request that I have here basically just goes through and guts all the priority stuff from the spec. It leaves enough there for implementations to understand the framing, uh, apply all of the rules with respect to um, the the length of the frame and the and the fields that are in the frame, so that the frame can be properly validated. Um, and if they receive a frame, they'll know what to do with it. But they don't have to do any of the prioritization stuff as a result. Sort of replaces it all with a tombstone saying that this entire priority scheme was not particularly successful, and um, leaves it at that. Um, it seemed like some people on the mailing list were reasonably comfortable with that general plan, but. Um, I want to check whether there's any support for this change because it's kind of big and it could be a little disruptive. So to be clear, um, this doesn't require new LPN. It no. effectively just makes the priority information in uh, that people might still be sending less meaningful uh, in that it was always hints. It was always an optimization. It just we're removing any meaning that it might have had. Yeah, so, so what would happen is that if someone implements the old spec, they they might send these frames, and someone implementing the new version of this would receive those frames, but essentially just throw them, throw them away. You would get no, no information out of them. I think it does point out that um, it might be might be sensible to consume that information if, if at all possible, because there is value in having some of that information, but it doesn't really ex expand on how you would do that. It refers to the old spec for that. Corey. Um, I j only just noted this on the issue, but uh, I think this intersects with Lucas and Kazuho's priority draft in interesting ways that we might want to uh, try to flesh out at some point if we are interested in going down this road uh, in particular the priority draft nominally deprecates the thing we are just about to rewrite. And uh, I don't know entirely how that's going to read. And I also wonder whether this we should consider in this work directing towards the priority draft in the event it finishes earlier. If it doesn't, then obviously that's going to be much harder. Yeah, so I, I originally didn't have a pointer into that priority draft because I wasn't sure how far along we were with it. But given the update we had from Lucas earlier, I'm actually thinking that it might be a good idea to, to provide that pointer uh, because I suspect I'll finish around the same time now. Ian. Yeah, I, I, if if they finish around the same time, I would definitely be supportive. Um, I think it, it, it makes sense. Um, I think I, I wish I had reviewed this PR before. If for some reason I missed it, I apologize. Um, I will definitely review it, but I, I think in a general direction, this is the right way to go. Um, but the reference to the priority draft makes it a lot more compelling. Yeah. So we, we, we seem to have some level of support for this. I just want to ask, does anybody have concerns about merging this PR going down this direction? I think if, in, if from where I sit now, it seems like we should have a consensus call on the list just to make sure that, that everyone's seen this. It's obviously some yes. of it. And uh, then if that goes well, well, we'll go ahead and merge the PR. Um, does anybody have any concerns they want to talk about at this point? That makes sense to me, just to insert myself quickly. Um, so, Martin, you mentioned, does this PR actually reference the old version of HTTP2? Like, would this take you back to that old RFC? It, it basically says the old version of this document included some other stuff and you'll need to read that document to understand what was here but it's a tombstone it's not a it's not like a normative reference or anything like that yeah i guess the other way i could see doing it is like you have an appendix on like, here's what the old stuff meant in case you see it and you want to interpret it so yep. okay so with... yeah and this document was still obsolete the old one we don't need to change that yeah yep. right yep. all right well, let's let's take it to the list then. It sounds like we've yep. done this. So the only other one that I, I kind of wanted to get a sense of, and we probably don't have time for it, is the upgrade mechanism. It turns out that I don't think anyone's implemented that um, at all. 
some people do the prior knowledge thing for clear text h2 but i don't think anyone's done the upgrade implementation i could be wrong but um there's no there's no widespread interoperability of that and we could potentially do the same sort of tombstone trick for that seems reasonable all right so um, that one requires a pull oh. request, and I'll have to have to work on that. We can discuss yeah, that once it's around. Sorry. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, the that's that's all I really want to say is yeah, we we should probably just remove it. Okay. I okay. think we should we should probably advertise that a little more widely to make sure that everybody in the group understands that. Yeah, I, I plan to do the same sort of thing as I did for the other, which was describe exactly how I intend to do it. Write the pull request, send an email to the list, and we can discuss those. In that. Okay. Yep. And if we see contention, we can do a consensus call on that too. I think we should do a consensus call on it anyway. It's one of the bigger changes. Sure. Yep. Um, you want to do seven seventy six real quick? Uh, oh, we can do this or not. I have no opinion. This comes down to the problems that Ian's highlighted. Uh, we need to run some experiments probably in order to work out whether we can do this. All right. So maybe if, if folks can start thinking about gathering data, that might really help. Yeah. Anybody have any comments on the greasing? Ian? Um, I, I think there are ways to move forward on this, but I think they're pretty complicated and I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of bad clients and bad servers out there that are just not going to be upgraded in a time frame that like we're happy with. Like, if you're waiting only to wait ten years, then I think there's a hope, but like that's an awful long time. Um, so I, I don't know what people want to do here, but I, I, you know, even when we talk about sending new settings and things, like um, everything like that seems fairly concerning to me. So um, uh, I think I would like everyone to take like a close look at this and really think about whether they think in their deployment scenario, they could actually deploy like a new setting or a new frame. Um, and if no, then try to figure out like what they can do to make that better or basically say like, no, this is basically impractical for us. Um, yeah. Ellen? So we've taken a couple of stabs at trying to break this rust off. Um, most recently was toward the end of last year. We tried to deploy the WebSocket setting again um, on all of the VIPs that Facebook serves. Uh, and we got it up to whatever, 90% with nobody really complaining. When we made it 100%, that made it so that the OK HTTP clients that were only succeeding because they were retrying now would consistently fail. <laughs> Um, and the people who the people who were still using it came and chased us down. Coincidentally, we had someone come by that week and say that Speedy wasn't working anymore, and we've had it had that disabled for like five years. But anyway, um, beside the point. So we we had to back off, and that team told us that they would fix their client and move forward. And so maybe we will be able to. But you know, we're not. You know, we we have a little bit more control probably over the general clients that that hit us and then everybody else does. So, but that's just some data. It, this is, this is hard. So I just wanted to say, you know, based on this discussion and, and our previous discussions about bracing, I, I don't think we should try and use this spec as uh, an opportunity to coordinate greasing. Uh, and it certainly shouldn't require greasing. But if we could put, if without a lot of effort, we could put some text into this draft to help support people when they do grease, to, to give them some, you know, something to point at and say, hey, uh, the spec says we can do this and it encourages us to do this, that would be helpful. Um, but I think that's probably as far as we can go in this particular effort. But it doesn't mean that people shouldn't continue doing experiments and we can talk about coordination later on, but I think in this spec, that's probably as far as we can go. Ian, you've queued and then dequeued. Oops, and my computer just, okay. I, I just add the note that we've enabled WebSockets for HTTP2 either two or three times, I'm not sure which. Um, and all those times we had to roll it back for various reasons. And the reasons were more complicated than, than what Alan uh, called out because 
some of them were internal clients and some of them were external clients. And yeah, we can force all the people at Google to upgrade, but we can't force anyone else to. Nope. Oh, I think Ian has other things to do at the moment. Thank you, Ian. For the briefest second there, I was like cat or baby, and then it was decided. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Martin, do you have anything else? I do not, and we okay. have no more time. We have no more time. I'm going to give a 30 second update on three more drafts. Um, we could also talk about to... Thursday. Sorry? We could also That's just true. talk about Thursday on Thursday. We have time then. That's true. We do have two hours. Core doesn't look like it's that bad. So, Leo, let's get that to those. So, uh, we'll see everyone in two days. I think for most of you, it's Thursday, but for some of us, it'll be Wednesday. No, Friday. Fine. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.